Let's get started. Great virus weather today, yeah, <laughs> appropriately. Also, Earth Day, we can talk about plant viruses. No, I did not plan on it this way, <laughs> just how it ends up happening. Um, I do have your Scantron, so afterwards, um, we get done early? What, get done early? What's that about? Um, I'll have a couple of days, and I'll just uh, have them out of here that be alphabetical um, by last names. And again, I've got scans of everything, so if there are any questions or problems with how they got filled out, please let me know. And I can go back and check out those scans. And there are a couple of things that I did want to talk about as far as the midterm is concerned. Um, these are questions that a large number of people did not answer the same way that I thought they should be answered. Um, and I wanted to go over them because these are some of the more important ones, I think, concept-wise, which I guess I didn't do a very good job on. So the first one that I wanted to mention was about the latent period on this one-step growth curve. Um, latent is what? No viruses. Yeah. So basically, no viruses detectable. So where do we actually start to see virus here? It's this black line. The infectious virus line. When does that start to get away from one? About 18 hours. Okay, is that clear to people? So, because I was surprised, I don't know, maybe I did a really crummy job of explaining this. Yes? So, does the latent period start at zero, or does it start at the bottom of that curve when it descends to where it starts to level out? So, the latent period starts at zero. So, maybe that was some confusion. Uh, because that's when you get the first infection should be at that zero point, because that's exactly when you have the virions associating with the host. So maybe that was part of the confusion. Sorry about that. Yeah? I had a question on the test. Is, um, was a non-developed virus, then would you be able to count like if there were 100, you know, 500 virions inside the cell that are infectious, would that, I guess that's not really that very well. Yeah, well, so the, the question, I guess, the, the, the question, I guess, does get back to the enveloped versus non-enveloped virus issue, and that has much more to do with eclipse versus latent period. And so eclipse would be if you have infectious virions inside the cell, but they haven't gotten out yet. Mm -hmm. so, uh, was, when I was looking at this question, I was like, how do you know if it was enveloped versus non-enveloped? Yeah, it but doesn't it, tell you here. Yeah. And so, but the latent period is independent of that. Oh. Okay, other questions, comments, worries. There was another, a couple of people were asking about burst sizes. Um, all that is, is what we have up here. So the number of infectious virus particles, again, PFUs per cell. So what's the maximum? It's going to be, it's a log scale, so this is going to be about, you know, 500 or so. Okay, other questions, comments, worries about the, the one-step growth curve? We're probably not going to look at too many more of them for the rest of the term, so why is he bothering? Um, this is really critical in terms of working with virology, and our lab is trying to make lots and lots of these, and it turns out to be a real pain, but you can get a huge amount of information from, from these, and mostly in terms of timing, you know, how long does it take to make any particular proteins, nucleic acids, etc. So the next one, um, this one was probably a little more esoteric, um, structure of the cone-shaped nucleocapsid of HIV-1, and maybe SSD-1 is thought to be derived from some kind of symmetry. Um, and the basic message here is that these are really two icosahedra, one at the top and one at the bottom, and in between are a bunch of hexamers. And so the whole idea of hexamer plus pentamer is a much more general idea than just, you know, helical versus um, icosahedral symmetry, but this really does seem to be pretty clearly derived from an icosahedrally symmetric. There's an icosahedron, here's an icosahedron, and what I sort of mentioned here in passing, and we may get back to this at the very, very, very end of the term, so you can look forward to the last lecture, um, is we think that SSV1, our favorite virus in the lab, and everyone who's taking their mutant viruses from Hell Lab as well, um, is two of these stuck together um, end to end. And so basically, um, two of these particles um, just fuse across the middle here. So that's, um, that's, again, probably more of an esoteric question than anything else. But it is important that it's not just totally bizarre and random. Um, these do really seem to have these particles. And 
Hopefully, we'll have a chance to talk about the HIV structure when we have our HIV lecture, but there's so many other things to talk about there that we'll see how far we get. So I thought I'd have another chance here. This seems to have confused many people, unfortunately. Um, this has to do with replication of single-stranded RNA virus genomes. We're going to be talking about single-stranded RNA virus genomes today. A big problem with a single-stranded RNA virus genome is you need to translate it and you need to replicate it. So the ribosome is going to be moving along the template from 5' prime to 3'. Prime. The replicase is going to be moving along the template from 3' prime to 5', prime, but it's replicating from what? 5 to 3. So you're always going 5 to 3. Nothing's going from 3 to 5 unless you're talking about exonuclease. So it's always 5 to 3 and 5 to 3. Um, this is relative to this template. And actually, when I pulled up this slide when I was putting this together, I realized this you know, opposite you know, orientation thing here as well. And so people might have gotten confused um, just from this. So does that also make sense to people? Yeah. Doesn't the conflict arise because it is proceeding in the wrong direction, though? Yeah, it's proceeding in the wrong direction. So I was actually very, very careful when I wrote this question to have polymerize here and not move because move would have been really confusing. But does the polymerization actually lead to a conflict? Well, the polymerization is because it's moving along the template in the opposite direction. It will lead to a conflict, yes. Because here, you know, if it's not polymerizing, there's no conflict. They're not running into each other. And we can argue semantics later. I'm not a great one for doing that, but <laughs> we certainly can. But probably here's not the right place. Yeah? Can you just restate which letter was the remaining? Oh, yeah, it's A. So um, the ribosome is moving from 5 to 3, and you really can't say that it's polymerizing from 5 to 3 because, of course, it's making amino acids. So that has to be movement. And the replicase, just like all of the polymerases that have ever been discovered to date, <laughs> all... <clears throat> extend, you know, either make the first nucleotide or extend from a 3 prime weight. So always going from 5 prime to 3 prime. So DNA polymerases, RNA-dependent DNA polymerases, DNA-dependent DNA polymerases, RNA-dependent RNA polymerases, RNA-dependent DNA polymerases, all of them are going to be going in that direction. Even some weird things like poly A polymerases, still same thing. So those are the um, the only things that I questions I had based on the exam, but of course, what else do we do? Because there's so much fun, clicker questions, yay! So <clears throat> if you have a mutation in the C3 protein in lambda that makes it inactive, the virus replicates normally, only lysogenically, only lytically, 50% lytically, 50% lysogenically, 10% lytically, 90% lysogenically. And again, feel free to talk, 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 talk. I know there are more than 15 people here. Fifteen. Okay, um, what does the C in C3 stand for? So, what do geneticists name things? 
based on phenotypes of mutants. What does C1, C2, and C3 stand for? Yes? Clear plaque. So clear plaque means what? Lysis and lysis only. So what is our answer? C is correct. Um, now, I'm sorry, and I, I tried to correct this a little bit on D2L. Um, I think I didn't mention so much about clear plaques versus what the alternative was. What's the alternative to a clear plaque? Turbid it's a turbid plaque. What's a turbid plaque? Anybody read what was on D2L or know already? So it's life in the middle of the plaque, I think is a great way of putting it. Um, so those are the lysogenic bacteria, which can now grow in the presence of lambda because they're protected from infection by lambda due to what? C1. The presence of C1. So if you have a mutation in C1, what do your plaques look like? Clear, Clear because they're completely lytic. Okay, does that make sense? Yes, no, huh? I'm sorry I did not explain turbid versus clear last time. So essentially, like the lack of like, anything going on in the middle of black is why it's clear instead of just Yeah, so um, if you have so nothing going on, i.e. no growth, <laughs> um, in the middle of your plaque, that means all the cells that were there are dead. So, and how are they dead? Usually by lysis. There are other ways of doing that, of course. It's you know, biologies. There are always exceptions. But at least as far as the bacteria are concerned in lambda, that's just lysis. It's literally blowing apart the cells. Okay, good. So um, <clears throat> to continue today again, happy Earth Day. Um, plant viruses, this is something we could you know, easily spend a year or a career working on, and we talk about them for about 50 minutes, which is really totally, completely, and utterly unfair. Um, but um, that's kind of the way the textbook is, and this is very much an overview of these different viruses. Um, so <clears throat> actually, let me hide this. Sorry about that. Uh, no, do this right so you actually get the right score. Good. Um, so we're going to talk, again, very generally about RNA viruses and concentrate on the bromoviruses. Um, I capitalized this on purpose. So these would be the brome mosaic viruses. So most of the plant virologists, um, we mentioned this before, but I wanted to mention it again. Um, you've got the hosts, what the disease phenotype is, and then the virus at the end. <clears throat> These guys have segmented genomes, which is a new thing, different pieces. Again, I like to think of these as kind of like different chromosomes. Um, and then one of the things is really specific to plants um, plants have a circulatory system, and probably a lot of you actually know more about plant biology than I do. Um, but <clears throat> what happens with these virus infections is they have to get from cell to cell, um, which is a very important process in terms of a virus infection of plants. And so some of the relatively small genomes here, a lot of them are involved in what's called movement, and moving that virion, moving the genome around inside the cell. And then we'll talk briefly about um, tobacco mosaic virus at the end. If people are more interested, here's the book. Um, this is one of the books on tobacco mosaic virus. So again, critical aspects here. Most of plant viruses are positive strand RNA viruses. There are a few exceptions to that, but the vast majority are RNA viruses. So kind of like that, what problem were we going to have? Translation versus replication, clearly. Obviously, it's going to be the same issue. Segmented genomes, again, this is a newer concept. Um, again, plants, G, go figure. Well, why so important that they're plants? So getting from cell to cell is really hard if you're thinking about plants. Plants have to be really tough in terms of dealing with their environment, and all of the cell walls around plant cells um, are really pretty thick. And so Dealing with that is clearly an issue that plant viruses have to be very good at. Um, conformational changes, um, this should hopefully be kind of a broken record. It will continue to be a broken record for the rest of the term. Um, and then some of the host effects we'll talk about a little bit. Um, actually, it turns out it's a, the response that a lot of plants get when there's a virus infection, so it's called the hypersensitive response. And so basically goes nuts right where that particular virus infection happened. And that's a good way of protecting the rest of the plant. So the, what's called the hypersensitive response on that. Um, 
Heat resistance of a lot of these plant virus particles, again, not surprisingly, they've got to be pretty tough to get inside of plants. But one of my favorite stories is actually not really about a plant virus. Um, it's a fungal virus that is an endophytic fungus and provides amazing heat resistance to the actual plant. Totally cool story. We'll get to that. I promise. Um, and then the helical structures again for TMV when we get to the end. So we'll start out with <coughs> CMV or cucumber mosaic virus. Uh, part of the problem with naming all of your viruses based on the species that they infect is if they infect multiple different species. And that's <laughs> the major issue with cucumber mosaic virus. It infects all kinds of different species of plants. And so people talk about this as being one of the viruses that has the widest host range um, of any virus. I don't necessarily agree with that, but we can talk a little bit more about that a little bit later on. Um, so we'll talk about where it was found, um, a little bit about the structure, um, entry and transmission. Um, this is one of the really big differences that we have with the plant viruses, um, how they get in and how they get moved from A, from plant to plant, um, because plants don't move terribly well. Um, so there's got to be some way of getting the virus from one place to another. Um, and that's the idea of a vector. And so we'll talk about vectors, hopefully viral vectors. I showed you my favorite viral vectors. Um, they're currently not sick. Um, but they did ride to school today on their bikes. Yes. Um, Earth Day. Um, <clears throat> so the whole idea of, of vectoring, moving the plant viruses around. Um, the replication of these viruses is also really quite interesting, again, having to do with um, how you get RNA to really replicate. Um, we'll talk at the end, this is sort of our second, second group, about satellites. We talked a little bit about helper viruses, et cetera, before. These I would not consider real viruses because they don't have a virion part of their life cycle. Um, these virus satellites are really fascinating. They're tiny little RNAs um, which cause disease or they stop disease. How they work, we really have almost no clue. Really fascinating process there. And then a couple of vignettes at the end. Um, cowpea chlorotic model virus, CCMV, um, is in fact one of the viruses I keep showing as a picture at the beginning of all my lectures. Get back to that. Um, hot viruses, um, and these are not the hot viruses like the ones we work in our lab, but these are the viruses that confer heat tolerance. And then um, tobacco mosaic virus. So just as a reminder, um, we're talking RNA viruses here, and these are i got to get rid of these numbers here. This is absolutely horrible. I guess, again, you guys, I think it was this term I first noticed that these are not the right Baltimore classification numbers here. So um, get, ignore the number. Let's put our dot right on top of it here. Um, so <laughs> these are single-stranded RNA viruses, which means that the positive strand is packaged inside the virion. So as soon as that strand is released inside the cell, cellular translation machinery can translate it and make all of those <clears throat> proteins that it needs for first replication of the genome and then making all of the vir virion proteins, etc. cetera. Um, again, this is a reminder. Where was this found? Um, actually, very early on in the discovery of viruses. Uh, 1916 was sort of the first report of these. Remember, it was the <clears throat> 1890s late 1890s, in fact, that the first viruses were described. So it was really quite early on. Um, a mosaic phenotype was a mosaic phenotype. This is one of the better pictures I found here. So this is a happy cucumber. This is an unhappy cucumber. Um, and that's what that mosaic phenotype um, really looks like. And again, these are called the cuckoo mode viruses. Cuckoo, well, cucumber. Uh, mosaic viruses and a very wide host range. Now, why do I put very wide in terms of host range? Because they affect all the entire cucumber family? Um, so um, the cucumber family, in fact, they infect outside of the cucumber family as well. They infect you know, literally hundreds, and in some cases people even say thousands of different species of plants. But what are plants relative to molecular diversity? They're minuscule. Um, so... Uh, some people argue that you know it's a very very wide host range. Well, it's a very very wide host range, given the number of species of plants. But in terms of thinking about really wide host ranges moving beyond those plants, it's really not that wide. So um, 
Again, whenever Stedman puts anything in quotes, it means he probably doesn't believe it. Um, well, oversimplification, yes. So um, what does the structure look like? Um, partly because these uh, viruses are growing in plants, so it's a heck of a lot easier to um, infect a whole bunch of plants and get a whole bunch of virus out of them. And it turns out you can get 10 to the 10th, 12th, 13th, 14th PFUs from one plant. Um, you can get really amazing numbers of plant viruses from these plants. They're also quite stable, again, because they've got to get from one plant to the next plant. So um, the structural virologists have been really excited about plant viruses because they're really easy to work with. So this is one of those examples. <clears throat> this is the CCMB, um, cucumber mosaic virus, not CCMB, um, cucumo virus structure. This one is, sorry, really easy to look at, unlike some of the other ones. So what's the key structure here? P3. P3, well, because it says it up there. <laughs> <laughs> but also should be very easy to find if someone were to give you this on an exam. But hey, yes, is that last time, so we won't ask this again. Um, so here's a five-fold axis of symmetry. Where's our other five-fold axis of symmetry? Down here. And how do we get from one to the next? Here, one, change direction, go one again. <laughs> eh? What? <laughs> okay, these are also um, purely quasi-equivalent. There's only one capsid protein. And so that one capsid protein can either form pentamers or hexamers. Mm -hmm. And so it's that whole quasi-equivalence thing here um, exactly perfectly. So the structure of one of those capsid proteins looks like this. It's got a beta barrel at the top. And I'll turn on my other pointer here, which is a little bit better. Um, and then, as we talked about packaging earlier on, um, how you get your nucleic acid inside the virion. Um, this is on the inside of the virus particle. This is on the outside. This is on the inside of the virus particle. Incredibly rich in arginine residues. What's the neat thing about arginine residues? They have positive charges. What charge does the nucleic acid have? Negative. It's going to be a very specific interaction in terms of sequence-specific interactions. Charges, sequence-specific? No. So just very general. And as we'll see, these particular particles, particularly for cucumber mosaic virus, um, bind lots of different RNAs. The virions are identical, but what's on the, uh, let's say the virion, the capsid is identical, but the actual nucleotides in the inside can really be quite different. The other thing I wanted to mention here is that this is also a beta barrel structure, but a very different kind of beta barrel than you see in my second favorite virus, STIV, and then the adenoviruses, PCMV viruses, uh, et cetera. But this beta barrel structure, for what's not really obvious reasons, seems to be very well conserved um, in a lot of these virus capsids. How do you get in? Well, plants are tough. Um, and this is, poses a real problem in terms of getting the genome inside a particular plant cell. Um, not unlike what happens with bacteria. Most bacteria are pretty tough because they're surviving out in the environment. So you've got to get in somehow. And this is how you get in. Um, it's a feeding process. Um, aphids, um, particularly for cucumber mosaic virus, but true for a lot of other plant viruses as well, um, they make a hole in the plant cell wall. And making a hole is a great way to get in, only this is now a vector. It's something else, not the virus having some kind of cool conformational change like bacteria for HD4. Um, now it's just making a hole. And plant virologists, when they're infecting their plants, what do they do? They scrape the cells on the top of a leaf and then put a little bit of virus on it. So it's almost identical to what's happening here. They're just sort of pretending to be aphids. So it's really a plant damage. You have to have physical damage to the plant in order to get infections to take place. Otherwise, plants are actually really good at resisting um, viral infections. Uh, the other thing which is really fascinating about certainly cucumber mosaic virus and a number of other ones as well, is it turns out that in order to get a productive infection, you need way more than one capsid. And why is that? It turns out that the capsids themselves are actually too small 
to incorporate the whole genome inside them. And so you have need multiple capsids to infect in order to get a productive infection. Um, and basically, the only way you can get that to work is if you have some way of doing a massive inoculation. How do you have a massive inoculation? Let's back up a slide. Um, it's because this EM is not high enough magnification. If we were to focus in right here, we would see that this mandible is absolutely covered in virions. So very, very large numbers. So the inoculum that you make, that actual infection process, this aphid coming in and sticking its mandible into the leaf, um, is going to be giving you many, many, many virus particles. Yeah? Uh, has anyone recorded any effect on the aphids? Ah, so the question is, um, has anyone looked at effects on aphids in terms of some of these viruses? Cucumber mosaic virus doesn't seem to cause too much of an effect on the aphids. Um, there are some other ones which are, do seem to have some effects. Um, and in fact, some of them may be, if you think about it from an evolutionary point of view, um, the fact that the virus requires this kind of vector, you would expect there's potentially even some kind of advantage for the aphid to be carrying these things. Um, so there's some issues with that, and actually it's rather controversial on some of these aspects of things. And, well, the viruses aren't supposed to make things happier, but you know, in some cases, and actually, at the end of today, we'll talk about a really nice example of that. Yeah. So the, the viruses go into the cells that are adjacent to the mandible instead of going into the um, xylem. Yeah. So we'll we'll talk about that in just a second. So the how the how the virions get to indiv individual and different cells. So usually when there's this cell damage that takes place, so it's not just damage to the tissue, the plant's damage to individual cells, and it seems to be that damaged cell is where the first set of virions is released. But it's later than this is my movement proteins get it to the rest of the plant. So what's in there, what's on the mandibles in these virions? Um, again, one of the most bizarre things about these plant viruses is that one... Virion will have this RNA in it, one virion will have this RNA in it, and sometimes a little bit of this one, and another virion will have these two RNAs in them. Um, and so in order to have a productive infection, you have to have these three sets of RNA. Not surprisingly, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but this is the replicase protein. This helps out with replication. CP stands for what? protein or capsid protein. You'll see this again and again and again. Um, <clears throat> so that's what you need in order to get replication. If you look at these individual segments or chromosomes of the virus, there are a couple of interesting aspects about it. We'll talk much more about these as we move through these different RNA viruses. These guys all have five prime caps. So methyl guanosine flipped around the opposite way. You know, very standard process. Why would you want to have a cap? What gets recognized by the cap? A lot of the translational machinery. These are positive strand RNA viruses. What's the first thing that has to happen? You need to translate them. So that's what happens to the five prime end. And anytime Stedman gives you a question on a RNA virus, you should be interested in what's going on at the five prime end and what's going on at the three prime end. So five prime end has a cap on it. The three prime ends of the cucumber mosaic viruses and then the close relatives have these very interesting structures we'll get back to a little bit later on. Um, funky little cloverleaf. And what does cloverleaf mean? We talk about molecular biology, molecular genetics. tRNAs, exactly. So these are structures that look a lot like tRNAs. And in fact, so much like tRNAs that they fool a lot of the translation machinery. Um, some of these plant viruses actually have poly A tails as well. And a, Poly-A tail would also make sense in terms of thinking about it from a translation point of view, because those are going to be pretty standard translation processes. <clears throat> so uh, these are the genomes that come in. What's the really bizarre thing about these plant viruses? That they're each individual segments and each individual virions. So how many of them do you need? Minimum number of different caps is required for successful infection by cucumber mosaic virus. Oh, sorry. 
I can't take that, sorry. Batteries? Yeah, is it a battery thing? Yeah, you can swap batteries. Because uh, once once you voted once. Quick, quick. Quick. Does it make a difference? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, turn off, turn on again. <laughs> yeah. Vote early, vote often. <laughs> <laughs> Which one's worn off? <laughs> Ten, Okay, um, I always hope that we're going to get 100%. A couple of questions actually on the exam, people got 100%, which I was, I was pretty excited about. So yes, it is three because you need RNA1, RNA2, and then the combination of three and four. Okay. Hide these. <clears throat> so I mentioned the three prime end of the genome. Um, this is what the three prime end of, interestingly enough, all of those genome segments look like. Um, this is the three, very three prime end of this. Um, <clears throat> and there's the five prime end continuous here for the rest of it. Now, it may not look like a tRNA in this particular orientation, but if you look at it in three dimensions, it turns out to have an extremely similar kind of structure. And so similar, in fact, that a lot of the cellular enzymes that usually work on tRNAs can, in fact, work on these structures at the very ends of a lot of these genomes. So uh, one of those is the CCA enzyme. Um, CCA enzyme adds it sounds like CCA, <laughs> to the end of the genome. And just like all polymerases, what direction does it go? 5 prime to 3 prime. Um, and this CCA is where normally that's where you're going to be getting the amino isolation that takes place, so the amino acid that gets added. And in some cases, you actually even do have the amino acyl tRNA synthetase that will put on an amino acid at the 3 prime end of your genome. And this is great. Because if you have an amino acid at the 3 prime end of your genome, all of the hungry exonucleases that would love to chew in at the ends don't have anything to chew on anymore because it's being blocked. And so that's probably one of the reasons that you have these. Uh, again, why? Why do you have these things? Well, why is the evolutionary answer, and so we don't really know. Um, but that actually seems to be a pretty good explanation for why you have these structures at the end. The other explanation for this is that having a tRNA-like structure is also going to help recruit all of the translation machinery um, to, of course, the problem is that's the wrong end because you actually need to be at the five prime end of the genome. Um, and so people argue about how important that actually is for the, the translation process. And there's some great researchers down at OSU, in fact, who are looking exactly at these kinds of questions and trying to figure out what's going on there. But let's move away from the structures that you have on your genomes to the proteins which are encoded in them. Um, probably the most obvious one is going to be your RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So yes, these are RNA viruses. They've got to replicate their RNA into RNA. So they need to have an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase because most cells don't have RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Uh, the other thing that hopefully you remember about each of these genomes is they've got five prime caps, and in some viruses, not cucumber mosaic virus, they have um, three prime poly A tails. Where do five prime caps and poly A tails usually get made in the cell? In the nucleus. Did these guys go to the nucleus? Did Stedman tell us about going to the nucleus? No. So they actually have their own enzymes 
which make these modifications. And we'll see this is going to happen again and again in, in a lot of the animal RNA viruses that we'll be talking about um, in the next couple of, um, couple of lectures here. So this RNA1 is a methyl transferase, and that particular methyl transferase will put methyl groups onto the 5' prime end <clears throat> of your genome, so very important for this capping process. It, but it's not just that activity that it has. And this is true for many of these. Um, you may or may not have noticed, but these are about, I should have, could have mentioned it anyway, they're about 3,000 nucleotides long. Each of the larger RNAs, RNA1 and RNA2, um, 3,000 nucleotides gives you how many amino acids? Divide by three. It's pretty straightforward, about 1,000. Um, 1,000 amino acids is pretty big. That's a pretty darn big protein. So many of these proteins have multiple domains, many of which have different activities. So it's not just methyltransferase that you get from this protein. It also has an RNA helicase domain. Um, why would you need an RNA helicase? Yeah, to make the negative strand, you need to separate it. What else are you going to have in most of these RNA genomes that were really important for getting translation in MS2? Secondary structures, exactly. So having that secondary structure, being able to disrupt that secondary structure is very important for getting um, virus replication to take place. <clears throat> the last one down here is our coat protein, um, RNA4. Again, RNA, arginine-rich domain at the N-terminal region. Um, which binds to RNA and then is regular quasi-equivalent capsid structure. Uh, <clears throat> the last one that I wanted to talk about is um, basically what I mentioned, hopefully now multiple times, is that movement proteins. And so getting from one plant cell to the next cell. This is very common in plant viruses. Just infecting those cells right next to where the aphid happens to bite is not going to be very productive in terms of making a whole bunch of, of virions and, and replicating. So all plant viruses need to get away from that particular point um, where you had the inoculation in the first place, and that's dependent on movement proteins and lots of different movement proteins as they move around. But let's first talk about replication. Um, as we mentioned, the RNA helicase, very nicely, it's important for separating your positive and negative strands, but also for disrupting secondary structures. One of the things that hopefully you remember from that last term, the molecular biology course, uh, double-stranded RNA. What happens when you have double-stranded RNA inside a cell? Gets chopped up, <laughs> RNA interference. So um, lots of cellular defense mechanisms against having double-stranded RNA. When are you going to have double-stranded RNA? You have a, oh, it's just a single-stranded RNA virus. Why do I have double-stranded RNA? Replication. When you have replication, you're going to have negative and positive strands together. So you're going to have double-stranded RNA inside the cell. As I mentioned earlier, the most of the plant viruses that we know of are positive-strand RNA viruses. So there are lots of double-stranded RNA which forms in these plant viruses. Um, and in fact, some of the best RNA interference defense mechanisms are in plants, and they were originally discovered, actually. RNA interference was originally discovered in plants as this presumably mechanism for protecting yourself against these single-stranded RNA viruses. So how the single-stranded RNA viruses figured out how to deal with this, figured out, again, totally over-anthropomorphizing, but <clears throat> um, evolutionarily speaking, what they end up doing is basically replicating in a separate part of the cell. They form kind of their own compartments which is then protected from this RNA interference machinery, and there undergo replication. And that's basically cartoon here. Um, here's one of our genomes. We've got our RNA polymerase, or the replicase, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. This then goes to a membrane, and this membrane basically seals itself off from the rest of the cell. So when you're making your double-stranded RNA, it's all here, protected from that other machinery. And then you just have your single-stranded RNA, which comes out here. This single-stranded RNA has a cap on the end. It's got your tRNA-like structure at the end. This gets translated and eventually gets assembled. That assembly process seems to go through a DNA-J-like process, 
Um, this is in fact known for bro mosaic virus, but this assembly process, putting capsids together, that is a process which seems to require chaperones. So just like GROWE um, for lambda, chaperones required for assembly here, chaperones seem to be required for assembly a lot of these viruses as well. So macromolecular structures need these chaperones. Plant viruses are no different than that. The last thing I wanted to mention in terms of these particular viruses are those movement proteins. It's particularly the 3A protein. I'm not going to ask you what protein is the movement protein in cucumber mosaic virus. And if I do, raise your hand during exams. It's Stagmite. You said you were going to do that. Um, so, but movement proteins, on the other hand, I think are a much more important aspect of what's going on here. So there are a couple of things that are important about these movement proteins. Again, getting into the cell in the first place, coming in through this cell wall, have to have some kind of damage. So that damage happens, usually aphids in the case of cucumber mosaic virus, scratching on the leaves in the case of the researchers. Um, then you've got the release of the genome, and in some cases also release of capsids, formations of capsids on the inside here. These then can move from cell to cell through these plasma desmata. So there are cell to cell connections, there have to be cell to cell connections in the plant for plant signaling. The viruses take advantage of that and either move their genomes through these or move the whole particles. And that's what you need the movement protein for. Again, 3A in the case of human mosaic virus, but other movement proteins in terms of other ones of these plant viruses. So that's what happens from <clears throat> cell to cell. And just down at the bottom here to remind me, um, cells also have vasculature, um, i.e. a circulatory system. So as soon as one of your virions or even the infectious RNAs, and remember it's got to be multiple RNAs in order to get all of the virions to form, then can get into the vasculature and then get spread throughout the whole plant. And the plant response to this, and I don't have a slide on this, but very often what the immediate response of a plant to one of these infections is, is to really shut off that region of <clears throat> the plant where you've had the original infection. And this is what's called the hypersensitive response. Um, and basically what that's doing is it's saying, okay, you can infect these couple of cells, but don't get any further than this. So prevent these virions from getting into the vasculature and spreading throughout the whole plant. And this is very often what you see if you look at disease plants and even in some of these mosaic phenotypes, a lot of that is the hypersensitive response. It's a response of the host in order to block spread. And also, not surprising, the virus has evolved to avoid this hypersensitive response as well. And also, a very active area of research in terms of looking at that. So that's our cucumber mosaic virus. I didn't talk too much about packaging. Um, packaging, people think, has to do with those 3 prime end structures. Um, the tRNA-like structures are probably also important for binding to the capsid protein and putting it together. Yeah? So the question is, is the shutting, you know, having sort of the hypersensitive response, I'm going to paraphrase your question, um, lead to that mosaic? People think yes, that that's probably the case. But if, it, if a true hypersensitive response, it's just going to be very localized to exactly where that virus infection was and not spread to the rest of the plant. So the fact that it's actually forming mosaic means that it's getting to a lot of other places. Yeah, David. Yeah, should our minds be a little blown that you kind of broke the one-to-one -one mapping of virus Thing, or is that extremely common in our minds were broken to begin with? Oh. <laughs> All of our minds are broken as soon as we start to think about virology. No, but this, this the whole idea that um, one virion yeah. is going to be one infectious unit, yeah. um, that's what everybody thought until they started to look at some of these things. And then, yes, the researchers' minds were blown <laughs> in the process as well. Um, and if you look at these, I didn't include the electron micrograph, but there is one um, at the beginning of the chapter. Um, all of these particles look identical under the electron microscope. And how the virion knows to package these different segments, how it knows to put three and four together rather than one versus two seems to be a size thing. So basically 3,000 nucleotides is what goes into one of these um, capsids. Uh, what amazes me is that that's been maintained. You know, 
evolutionarily speaking, which basically means that you know, you're absolutely dependent on these vectors because you're absolutely dependent on having some kind of damage to the plant in order to be able to be transmitted. So yeah, that's that is really kind of kind of mind blowing and a very different process. Yeah. Cucumber mosaic thing, or is no, it it's not like just cucumber mosaic. mosaic. You see this very commonly in a bunch of different plant viruses. So it's not just cucumber mosaic virus. Yeah. Uh, will you just really quick uh, explain the DNA J like? Uh, okay, so the DNA J like story is basically this packaging. So the the reminder here for packaging. So DNA J, um, DNA K, DNA J are classic heat shock proteins. Uh, you take your E. coli, you blast it with a little bit too high temperature, it expresses these proteins, and they seem to be really involved in protein folding and making sure that you get appropriate protein folding taking place. Uh, but we also now know more and more, and in fact the grow E, grow EL protein foldases were originally found in Lambda because you couldn't grow Lambda on these guys that had mutants. Um, so <clears throat> these chaperones are not just important for refolding proteins, they're also very important for assembling structures like virions. Okay, um, want to have our minds be blown a little bit more? <laughs> um, these are the satellite RNAs. <clears throat> so if you look at the RNAs, which are just being packaged in these virions, very often there'll be extra RNAs, which are in there as well. These are tiny, you know, some even smaller than 100 nucleotides barely encode proteins, if at all, um, and probably not encoding proteins, but have a huge effect on the disease phenotype of the um, virus infection. And just changing a couple of nucleotides, and that's what's shown here in some of these structures, all which are highly secondary structured, um, highly, so highly secondary structured, most of these bases are paired, even though they're often single-stranded RNAs. Um, just changing a couple of these nucleotides, the ones here in brown, and no, I'm not going to ask you whether it's the GC base pair that was changed, um, but just changing a couple of nucleotides can change some of these satellite RNAs from causing the virus infection to be hypervirulent, i.e. spreading all over the plant, or actually shutting it down and apparently helping the hypersensitive response. Uh, and so what these small RNAs are doing, we really have no idea. Um, and we're trying to get a handle on what they're interacting with. It's probably interacting with some kind of cellular RNA binding proteins, but how that's working is still, a, I think, a very, very open question. So um, just thinking about, um, again, we could spend easily multiple lectures talking about satellite RNAs, yeah? Are the satellite RNAs being replicated by the mosaic viruses replication machinery? Yeah, so these... these um, Satellite, uh, satellite RNAs, I should say. I should call them satellite viruses because they're, they don't have capsids. Um, they certainly don't encode them. They're being encapsidated by the capsids that the <clears throat> other virus brings in and also appears to be the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase from the virus, which is replicating all of these small um, satellite RNAs. So it doesn't, it's not a cellular process. It's all a viral process. Yeah? Where do they originate? <laughs> Where do satellite RNAs come from? Um, that's, that's an absolutely fabulous question. And since they're so short um, and they're not incredibly well conserved, it's very hard to identify where they came from. They're not an obvious like your piece that was part of a virus genome at some point in time. There are no obvious sequence similarity to any sequence that you had in the virus genome, for instance. Um, partly probably because a lot of these RNA-dependent RNA polymerases don't have error-correcting machinery, so that's a potential reason for that. Um, probably it's the secondary structure, which is much more important, rather than the actual sequence. And looking at secondary structure, trying to analyze you know, where that came from phylogenetically, best of luck. <laughs> so, but there's, there's no obvious sequence. It's not like it, it was a piece that got you know, stolen from somewhere else and is, is now replicating by itself. That's not an obvious case, no. Okay, so let's just talk about a couple of, I think, totally cool stories for the last 15 minutes or so. Um, again, you probably noticed this <clears throat> structure um, that I have in my title slide all the time. Um, this is Calpi chlorotic mosaic virus. So what does it infect? Calpi, what does it do? Make chlorotic mosaic um, virus. But the reason that 
I'm interested in this is um, actually not so much because it infects cowpeas, um, but much more um, from the structural point of view. Um, this also has a really nice T equals 3 icosahedral structure, quasi-equivalent, um, packages two different RNAs, but who cares about the RNAs? Well, who cares about the RNAs? The reason you care about the RNAs is somehow an RNA needs to get out of this incredibly stable structure into the cell. How does that happen? Well, in this case, what happens, if you change the pH of the environment, this virion goes from here to here and actually goes back and forth. You can you know, get this to move back and forth, even in the absence of any RNA at all. And you can literally just express the capsid protein of this and make these empty virions or virus-like particles, and it does exactly the same thing, um, which is really cool. Um, there's the, <laughs> the lab I did my postdoc in, that's the other half of it, which wasn't working on the hot viruses, was working on this stuff. And why they were working on it um, is using these as basically nano tools, nanobiology, nanotechnology kinds of things. Because if you've got a hole in a structure that you can reversibly open and close, you can put all kinds of neat stuff inside them. So um, one thing, and this may be a little bit hard to see over here, um, these are all of these virions all just lined up right next to each other. Because you can get such huge numbers from an infected plant, you can get just massive amounts of these virions, and they're all perfectly icosahedrally symmetric. They can line up with each other. Um, and so these are all of those right here. Um, hang on, Patrick, I'll get you just a sec. Um, one of the things that this particular group has done, actually Mark Young and Trevor Douglas, Montana State and Indiana, have put in magnetic particles, basically, in the inside. So you can put ferromagnetic particles in the inside of each of these particles and then lay them down as arrays like this and then blast away all of the proteins. You end up with this amazing array of 30 nanometer ferromagnetic particles, which is about... 50 times the density of any of the hard drives that are currently in existence. So they were, in fact, sponsored by Panasonic to do some of these experiments. Yeah, Craig, your question, Nick. I was going to add one more thing. MTCC and the virions are they binding each other at all, or are they just sort of loosely passed out together and let it trace So, yeah, so the, um, the, the, that conformational change that happens in the capsid protein. Um, so it, it just seems to be in the capsid protein itself. It can undergo this change just on the change of pH or the change of ionic strength. Can they get much bigger when they open up? Or they yeah, so this, they actually do get considerably larger when they open up. It's a little hard to tell, I guess I don't know if you can see here. Um, but yeah, it's about a 15% increase in terms of the diameter. Um, but the main important thing is you make holes here. So you make the holes, you can put in your interesting stuff and put them back in. Uh, Trevor has been doing a lot of this stuff to try and put in chemotherapeutic drugs in here. Another thing, if you can now design these particles, get them to a particular place, you can use them to deliver particles. Also, um, MRI, using these as contrast agents. Yeah. Any idea how you get them to play nice and arrange a single layer like that? Um, how do you get them to play lice and arrange in a single layer like this? Uh, it turns out that there is a lot of things people have done with material science in order of looking at um, finding layers. And so one way to do that is just have a lipid layer. You can have a monolipid and then lay these things on top of that. That works really quite nicely. Uh, but getting the arrays and getting the form perfectly, I guess, without too many mistakes in them is clearly an issue. And that's one of the issues that they're trying to deal with. So cool virus-based nanotechnology. I don't know, some of you may have noticed um, a guy who was just hired by Brian Drucker um, at the Knight Cancer Center, um, a fellow by the name of Sadiq Ezener, um, who's now at UC San Diego, but is moving up here to bring up his lab. Uh, he actually does this kind of stuff with virus-like particles and chemotherapy, and we're collaborating or competing based on the patent that I have that he actually is licensed to his company. So um, there's probably going to be a lot more virus and nanotechnology happening um, in Portland in the next couple of years. I'm pretty excited about that. So <clears throat> switch gears completely, although it's also close to Montana State, so that's the connection here. Tough transition. Um, one of the things that we notice when we go to Yellowstone and we're looking for the really high temperature environments to find our favorite viruses in, 
one of the things we notice is that there is this thing called panic grass. Um, Dicanthelium lanuginosum, um, really broad-leafed um, grass that grows basically right up to the edge of some of our hot springs. Um, and one of the things that you can actually tell if you see where these plants are growing is the soil is almost exactly 50 degrees Celsius because these plants can grow up to about 50 degrees Celsius, which is really pretty amazing. Uh, the even more amazing thing is that these grasses can only grow at these high temperatures if they have an endophytic fungus in them. Endophytic, so these are fungi that grow inside the plant. Um, curvularia is one of these, um, Curvularia perturbata. Again, I'm not expecting you to know all these names, but it turns out that just the fungus is not enough. Of course, what do we need? A virus! So these plants that grow at 50 degrees Celsius can only grow at those high temperatures if they have an endophytic fungus and that endophytic fungus is infected with virus. No fungus, no growth. No virus, no growth. Which is really pretty amazing. This is the uh, figure from the paper. These are our wild type grasses grown at high temperature in the lab. Um, they grow very nicely. Here, if they don't have the fungus, they're not happy. If they don't have the virus, they're even less happy. And if they have neither of them, they really have problems. And so that's basically here. This is the, in fact, up to 55 degrees Celsius. Um, this um, article, by the way, is, is on D2L, so you can take a look at it. Um, so here's a happy plant. The only reason this plant is happy is because it's infected by this fungus, and that fungus is actually infected by the thermotolerance virus, CHTV. This is a plant virologist who has, in fact, been, been looking at some of these studies. So uh, as if our mind hasn't been blown enough today, <laughs> this one, to me, is, a, I think, probably the best example on how virus infection is beneficial for the host. Finish up with going way, way back in time. Um, tobacco mosaic virus, yes, this was Contagium vivum fluvium. So the disease-causing agent that went through all these filters that the bacteria couldn't get through. Um, this is an example of not a tobacco plant, um, but in fact a tomato plant being infected by tobacco mosaic virus. So again, the names of some of these viruses may not necessarily correspond to what all their hosts are. Um, this is, in fact, one of the reasons that um, none of my colleagues want me to be growing these viruses in the lab. Um, hang on, we got this uh, another clicker question. Oh, no, he's too fast. We'll go back. Um, so <clears throat> this was the um, original virion, and again, here's that structure, helical RNA virus. Yes, we all remember that one from the midterm. Um, so <clears throat> here we are. The last clicker question for today, which hopefully everyone will be able to answer properly, right? Good. Turn my clicker on here. Thermotolerance of dicanthelium, hang on, start, yes. Um, Lanigosum is due to fungal infection, plant virus, fungal virus, air pressure, A and C. <laughs> Pardon? <laughs> Air pressure? Air pressure, yeah, that's it. Now, you find it's a high altitude, so the high, so the high altitude, and so this is the high altitude. Ninety-eight percent.
percent. I don't know. So someone, someone's trying to ruin my statistics. I can tell. I will find out who you are, <laughs> and I won't give you an extra point. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> So one of the things that I was doing when I, in fact, uh, started to prepare this lecture and this whole course is I went way back in the literature. And so, in fact, this is from Byron's paper of 1898. And when I read this, um, I was amazed, admittedly in translation, um, that he was so spot on in terms of understanding viruses um, and their infection processes, et cetera. And so again, you know, by low, the nomenclature, how people write papers at that time is slightly different. Um, I don't think I would ever get away with incontestable um, <laughs> uh, experiments, but it's, it's really, really impressive. If you're interested at all in you know, the history of science, history of virology, um, this is in fact a link to um, that paper um, here in its entirety, um, where he talks about thermal stability and, and all of these other kinds of things um, in that process. A couple of highlights. Um, it's not just contagium vivium fluvium. He, loses, he actually uses virus, the term um, is in there, so originally came from that. Um, he talks about it only being able to grow in infected plant tissue, and so he understands that it has this you know, obligate intercellular processes um, does heating and drying experiments with these individual you know, preparations that he had. Really amazing, you know, all the stuff that he was doing um, in the late 1800s um, as far as that whole process. So um, that in and of itself is really pretty amazing, but you, know, you don't write a whole book on that. Um, TMV itself <clears throat> was one of the very first viruses to be studied in more detail at all. Uh, people actually knew more about the virion and probably any virus at that point than anyone else. Um, TMV, tobacco mosaic virus, partly because one of these plant viruses, you can get huge amounts of it, was really easy to crystallize. And the fact that you could crystallize the particles of tobacco mosaic virus was one of the main reasons that people said viruses weren't alive, because you can't crystallize life. But it wasn't the virus they were crystallizing, they're crystallizing virions. And so that's, again, one of these dichotomies in terms of thinking about viruses versus thinking about virions. Um, Wendell Stanley is the um, guy who got the Nobel Prize basically for crystallizing tobacco mosaic virus. Um, he went and started the virus lab here at um, UC Berkeley. Um, this window right here over on the right hand side is the window of the office of the professor who I did one of my rotations with um, when I was working up there. Um, but this was um, a few years ago. Um, that building has been rebuilt. It looks a lot nicer now. Um, of course, that was way since, since I was there. So this is their new um, QB3 Center Quantitative um, Biology. But one of the things that Wendell Stanley said um, was that TMV was just protein, um, and in fact, he was convinced that this whole infectious particle was in fact just protein, and it was only through work a number of years later, which is outlined very nicely um, in this book, um, that in fact there was also a RNA that was associated with it. And so this, of course, is the structure now. Um, here's the protein. Um, wow, finally we have a virus capsid protein that isn't a beta barrel. Um, and this is the um, high resolution now crystal structure, not surprisingly because it crystallizes really well, um, showing the RNA with this capsid protein um, wrapped around it and really nice helical symmetry. And just for scale, I love this image because you know we're just looking at this little tiny bit here and that's that whole um, virion here. What we don't have time to do is go to um, this PDB site um, you can go to this site and take the virion and spin it around and pop it up and down and um, play around with the actual structure here um, and take a look at it. So that's all I have for today. We're done 30 seconds early. Um, and I have your scantrons here if you would like to come pick them up. <laughs>